that's the perspective I'm going to give you today because I've done all of those things. 2017 was actually a milestone in my life. My first fire was 1977, so that gives me 40 years under my belt. That's, uh, that's a long time I'll be doing this stuff. You know, as long as we have forests, we're going to have fires. There's no question. It's just it's, it's a mathematical equation. When the moisture is diminished to the point where it can be ignited and stay lit, you're going to have a fire. It's no different than it was 300 years ago. And it's going to be no different 300 years from now. So where do we, where do we fall in with this? Uh, what can we do? 300 years ago, Mother Nature was the uh, forest manager, primarily. Oh, we have some evidence that Native Americans contributed to some of those management, but pretty, pretty minor evidence, but some. Today, we got 330 million people in this country. We contribute to uh, forest management and also some of its demise. When you look at more than 65% of the fires are man-caused. Man-caused. When I did a little research on that and just kind of scratched my head a little bit, I said, you know, if we take these fire seasons and we remove 65% of the fires out of the equation, we're no different than we were 300 years ago. It's, it's fires burn, just like I said. When the moistures are diminished and you have ignition, you have a fire. Those, the forest could be just a tender box. If you don't have ignition, you don't have a fire. Like I said, it's a mathematical equation. I want to dispel some of the rumors that I hear in the newspapers. I hear, oh, it's climate change, and it's this, and the forests are overstocked. And, you know, I don't know if it's climate change. I mean, you can't, you know, we got this many people on this planet. That's got to have some effect on the climate. I, I don't know to what point, but uh, I don't even know if it's measurable. I have no idea yet. But I do know people have a big effect on forest and forest fires. The more people that we have living in that, what we call the urban interface, it's where the forest meets the people, we have those ignition sources. Our fire seasons are the same, it's just we have more ignition sources and more fires, uh, especially at the low elevations. You know, if you unwind the clock, back to the early days of the Forest Service, and I, I always like to go use the fires of 1910 as a great example. Fires of 1910 burned up 3 million acres in Idaho, Washington, and Montana. And if you look at what caused that fire season, you, you say, well, they had a really good winter, a great snowpack, a decent spring, and then in midsummer they had a series of 100 degree days, and afterwards they had a lightning storm, and boy, did we have a fire. Burned up 3 million acres, and I think 87 people lost their lives. You look at the fires of Wisconsin and Minnesota in the late 1800s, same thing. We had the conditions in the forests. They could be lit, and, they, and the fire driven, and it burned up thousands of acres, communities, and thousands of people lost their lives. You know, after the fires of 1910, the fledgling Forest Service, they kind of took on that policy that we're going to try to suppress all fires because when they get out of hand, they get out of hand. And they did that until the 90s. And then they kind of changed things and went to forest management. And the reason for that, the argument was, we suppressed all these fires, which was the natural way to manage the forest, a natural way to reduce the fuel loading. and Partially, I agree with that. That's true. And some of our forests did. We have far too many tons per acre. Um, and some of that could be because we have suppressed fires. No question about it. But we have a human element, too. 300 years ago, we didn't have 330 million people living in this country. Okay, That human element don't like forest fires. They didn't like it. 75 years ago, and they still don't like it today. And I don't know about you folks, but this summer, my phone was on fire itself with the complaints, amount of complaints. So we have this, it's, an, it's a problem. What are the solutions? You know, when I started talking about we have to do something about, about uh, 
forest management, the first thing the newspapers reported is Senator Bertrigger wants to log. Logging's not the total answer. It's, it can be part of it. Fire's part of it. You know, controlled burns. The problem with controlled burns in Oregon is our Environmental Protection Agency won't let us burn. We don't have enough burn days in the spring or the fall. If we're going to treat acres and treat it with low intensity fire, we, we're going to have to have opportunities to burn. And I'm going to tell you, July and August are not those opportunities, okay? Those opportunities lie in the spring and the fall. It's that simple. Some people blame the Forest Service that they have a let it burn policy. I, I, I don't know if I, I want to go that far and say that the Forest Service has a let it burn policy. They may have a unform, I don't think they have a formal one, but they may have kind of an informal one. You know, we had fires in uh, Southern Oregon this year that started in July and were let burn, or we didn't put people on them for a variety of reasons, and you can get in long debates over those. All as I know is I can remember looking at fire models back in the 90s on those areas, those wildernesses in Southern Oregon. It was determined, these are Forest Service fire models produced by Forest Service employees that said, you know what, if we get a fire in these wildernesses before the 1st of September, we got to put them out because it isn't going to be a pretty picture. And I think the people of Brookings understand that picture. We got to use our, we got to use all the tools, all the education, all the science to manage these forests. And it's going to be a difficult task. You know, the federal government has over 15 million acres. I hear other people say, well, we got to do this um, project work or we got to do fuel reductions work and everything. <laughs> Let me tell you something at one to two to three thousand dollars per acre and you got 15 million acres just on the federal side. Yeah, who's going to pick up that tab? That's going to be interesting. And it's just not the federal governments that that have some issues with overstocking. The private lands have issues too. And state lands have issues too. Okay. And it's not because we're not trying. It's just it's a big task at hand. So as we move forward in the state of Oregon, we have to move forward in a way that we pull all of these entities together. And we respect what the citizens are telling us. And we change our policies. And we recognize that, yes, we're going to have fires. Yes, we can do more for forest health. Some of that may, may be logging. It's really not a dirty word, OK? And it can be beneficial, despite what some people may think. But if we don't, you know, I've never seen a forest that actually benefits from a high density fire. I've seen many forests benefit from low intensity fires, but I have been yet to see a forest benefit from a high intensity fire. The Chetco fire this year burned over the Biscuit fire and the Silver Creek fire. That area is going to be changed for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. It will not come back the way it was originally 50 years ago, that we'd seen 50 years ago. It'll take a long, long time. And we have to recognize that people are going to continue to live in these urban interface areas. And when fire goes through there, and I think we've seen in California, I know I was in California in my younger years working on fires, and I used to always say, you know, in Oregon, you, sometimes you can't run fast enough. California, you can't drive fast enough. That's how fast the fires move in some of those areas. I've worked uh, with municipalities, and I've, I've worked with the Mid Peninsula Open Space Dif District out of San Jose trying to predict, and you know, they just keep setting themselves up for, for a disaster. It'll come. We have, when we have these high intensity fires, it doesn't do wildlife any good, doesn't do the forest any good, doesn't do people any good. So when I look at the fires in Oregon, I am going to be, I'm going to be very open that we need to suppress fires during fire season. And we need to put more money and more resources into forest management, especially with controlled burns. And we're going to have to figure out a way to talk to our public 
to let us have those days in the fall and in the spring. And with that, I'll take any questions. Actually, it would be great if we could just move on, sure. Senator. Thank, thank you very much for the.